Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today we're back out at Doula's Den, and our topic today is going to be Colt Model P, their single action army revolver. Now this gun has been in almost continuous production for 150 years, and to a casual observer, looking at a gun from 1873, or a gun from today, they look very much the same. However, over that almost 150 years, this gun has overgone a number of changes. So our topic today is going to be the evolution of Colt Single Action Army Revolver. You know, Colt originally called this gun the New Model Army Colt's Cartridge Revolving Pistol. Now luckily, that moniker did not stick. And it was quickly shortened to Peacemaker, and then shortened further to Model P. But whatever you call it, this gun has been with us for over, well, for almost 150 years. And it's become an American icon. During the 20th century, thanks to almost 100 years of Hollywood movies, this gun was the most recognized handgun on the planet. You could go anywhere in the world and people would recognize this because John Wayne carried one of these or Clint Eastwood carried one of these uh, and was tremendously famous. Now, I don't know if that is any longer the case because there really has hardly been a Hollywood Western made for the last generation. However, in the 21st century, video games like Red Dead Redemption and Hunt Showdown have kept the Model P in the minds of entertainment goers, I guess we would say. And I think it's fair to say that Colt's Model P, this gun, is considered to be the quintessential cowboy gun. So today we're going to take a look at the development of the Model P from its earliest incarnations up until the present day. Though most of what I'm going to talk about happened during the first generation of Colt's production, which basically was from 1872 until the beginning of World War II, uh, where they needed to clear out that old machinery and make some room to make the weapons needed to fight the war. So a lot of the things I'm going to talk to you about, the evolution of the Colt, happened during that first generation. Now, Colt did have its predecessors, and the Single Action Army was not the first metallic cartridge firing handgun of the United States Army. And that honor goes to the Smith & Wesson American, which was a break top revolver chambered in the 44 American cartridge six shot and it predated the Colt by about four years. Though the Army didn't use that many, there were 32,000 Smith & Wesson Americans made between 1869 and 1874. So it certainly had its adherents on the frontier. And because it was the original Army revolver, when the Army called for pistol trials in 1872, Colt was already developing the Model P. And the gun they submitted to the trials, the samples, were chambered in 44 Smith & Wesson American caliber because that was the official Army cartridge at the time. Now, as it turned out, the Army was not happy with that cartridge for a variety of reasons. In fact, really nobody was. Uh, the Russians didn't like it, the Army didn't like it. In fact, the Russian Army and the American Army both had very similar objections to it. It was an outside lubricated heel base bullet, uh, think like a 22 long rifle shell today. And because of that, it picked up all the grit in the environment because the lubrication was actually on the part of the bullet that was outside of the cartridge case. So the Russians wanted an inside lubricated bullet, which are the, the types of cartridges that we have generally today. 
and their answer was the 44 Russian cartridge. The American Army went a different direction because the 44 American cartridge, uh, the outside diameter, was closer to 45. So they asked Colt to develop a new cartridge for the single action army that would be in 45 caliber, and they gave Colt basically free reign on that. So Colt did. Uh, in fact, they'd already been working on one. So they resubmitted their guns to the trials, chambered for 45 Colt. Now, William P. Mason, uh, who you'll be quite familiar with if you're in any way involved with Colt history, filed the first patent on the Model P in 1872. And when they submitted the, uh, the rechambered guns to the Army for the tests, it easily beat out the Smith & Wesson. And by 1873, the Colt Model P was the Army's revolver of choice. In 1873, the Army placed an order for 8,000 Model Ps. And eventually, over its, uh, its life cycle as the Army revolver, which went until 1892, the Army bought 38,000 Model Ps. The Model P that the Army bought looked very much like this. It was a blued 7.5 inch barreled six shot revolver that was single action, and by single action we mean you had to manually cock it before you could fire it. The frame was wrought iron and it was color case hardened. And the only difference between that one and this one is that on the original, the grips were one piece varnished walnut and these are two piece hard rubber. As I said, those early frames were of wrought iron. Colt changed over to steel for its frames in 1883. The military Model P's were all chambered for 45 Colt. A proprietary round, but the government rounds were all loaded by the Frankfurt Arsenal. And the government rounds were not conventional center fire rounds the way we think of them today. In fact, they looked like rimfire rounds, and, and the technology was very much rimfire technology. So this was a copper case, soft copper case. It was a center fire, but it was internally primed. So the back of the cartridge case was flat. There was a little metal band fitted inside of the cartridge case, was crimped in, which held the primer. And that was centered, and the firing pin hit the, uh, the back wall of the cartridge, which was completely flat, and detonated the primer just the way a rim fire does it when it hits the flat rim of the cartridge and detonates the primer stuffed in the rim. It's exactly the same thing. The case was very soft, um, which, which would cause problems later on. But essentially, the round was the same as the civilian round. It had 40 grains of black powder and a 255 grain tallow lubricated bullet. This load out of a seven and a half inch barrel developed a muzzle velocity of over a thousand feet per second. But the Army Ordnance Board decided that it was really too powerful for the average soldier to shoot. So they reduced the load to a 250 grain bullet over 30 grains of black powder. And that was a standard military 45 Colt load until the end of the 19th century. In 1875, the Army adopted the um, Smith & Wesson Schofield revolver as a secondary cavalry arm. And I'm probably gonna do a separate video just on the Schofield so I'm not going to get into too many details on it here. So they ended up with a real logistical problem. Because now they had two different cartridges for the two different guns. And that caused some mix-ups. Um, and in fact, there, there are plenty of documented cases of commands that had the Schofield 
requisitioning the Colt cartridge because they were so used to requisitioning the Colt cartridge. Then getting the Colt cartridge and none of them fit in their guns and, and they could be in the field, you know, actively uh, patrolling against Indian depredations and they don't have ammo that fits their guns. So it was a problem. Now, sources disagree on this. There are some sources that say that the Schofield ammunition would work in the Colt, but that they had, Frankfurt Arsenal had already produced so much 45 Colt, and because the government is uh, very reluctant to dispose of anything that can be used, they encouraged units that had 45 Colt guns to requisition the Frankfurt Arsenal 45 Colt. Uh, but if you got Schofield ammo, it would work. However, other sources, and sources that I respect, say that that wasn't the case, that the original Schofield rim was so big, and they were big because they wanted a very positive ejection from that star extractor, right? They were so big that they would overlap when you put them in a Colt cylinder, turning the Colt revolver into effectively a three-shot revolver. Now, I happen to believe that, and the reason I do believe that is because if that was not true, the Frankfurt Arsenal would not have taken this next step. Because in 1882, they developed a new compromise 45 caliber cartridge. And that cartridge was Schofield length. But it had a modified rim. Now the rim on the Colt was too small to work with the star extractor, the Schofield. Uh, the rims would slip underneath it and jam the gun up. You'd be picking them out by hand. And in the meantime, the Indians would be making a pincushion out of you. Right? Not a good thing. So, so you couldn't just cut down the 45 Colt and use it in both guns. And the Schofield rims apparently were too big to use in a Colt gun. So what? What the Frankfurt Arsenal did is it came up with a cartridge that was Schofield length and it had a compromised rim. It was big enough to work with the star extractor of the Schofield, but not so big that it overlapped if you loaded it in a Colt single action army. And uh, that was designated the model 1882-45 cartridge. And it replaced both the government Schofield cartridge and the government 45 Colt cartridge. And it remained the official cartridge for the next 10 years until the 38 Long Colt replaced it with a double action revolver that the Army picked up. Uh, that was loaded with a 230 grain bullet and 28 grains of black powder. And it also had the added feature that instead of being internally primed, it was boxer primed. In other words, it had the same type of primer that you would use today uh, on your reloading bench or that you would see in modern ammo that you would buy. And the Frankfurt Arsenal did that so that units in barracks could reload their ammunition and actually get some practice in. Uh, because there wasn't a whole lot of practicing going on in the Army in the 19th century because ammunition cost money and Uncle Sam was notoriously cheap at that time. So the 1882 cartridge replaced the Schofield cartridge and it replaced the 45 Colt cartridge. And uh, in fact, it became the basis for the 45 ACP cartridge later. 760 feet per second was what that load delivered. And you know, that uh, 760, 800 feet per second is about what the original 45 ACPs delivered. So the Army deemed that to be a satisfactory chambering for man stopping. So let's talk about barrel lengths in the U.S. military Colt Single Action Army handguns. All of the Colt Single Action Army handguns produced for the military were produced with the 7.5 inch barrel length. 38,000 of them. And they were called the cavalry model. But all branches used them. Now in 1892, the Colt Model P was replaced with a 38 caliber double action revolver as the official sidearm 
of the U.S. Army, which relegated the Model P to being a secondary arm. In 1895, a number of surviving Model P's were sent back to the Colt factory to be rebarreled as five and a half inch guns. And many of those were subsequently issued to the light artillery and used in the um, Spanish-American War. So because of being issued to the artillery, they picked up the designation of artillery Colts. So those guns weren't made as five and a half inch barrels. They were made as seven and a half inch barrels and then shortened. Uh, but I think that was probably a pretty, a pretty wise choice. Between 1900 and 1903, a second batch of obsolete cavalry model guns were sent back to Colt to be rebarreled in five and a half inch barrel length. And those were sent to be used in the Philippine insurrection. And I've told you the story before, you know, the 38s were just not doing the job on those hopped up Moros uh, who could absorb lead like a sponge and keep coming and then stabby stabby to, to our guys, right? So the troops wanted 45s. And they were issued a number of uh, Model 1878 double action 45 Colt guns, which I have to tell you, those things are abysmal to shoot. Uh, but there weren't enough of those to go around, and therefore the artillery model Model P's were sent back out to be used by the troops, who apparently appreciated them very much. So you might wonder what the, those Model P's cost the Army back in the 19th century. And the answer is $13 a gun. That was the starting price. Eventually, Colt reduced it to $12.50 a gun. Um, kind of wish we could see those prices again today. <laughs> All right, so that's some military Model P's, and let's talk about the civilian guns. For the first couple of years, Colt was so tied up with their original contracts for the Army that all of the civilian guns that were sold started off as Army guns but were rejected by the inspectors, usually for very minor problems, blemishes, uh, maybe checkering on the hammer, little, little things. What Colt did with most of those guns was nickel plate them and sell them on the civilian market. So those would have all been seven and a half inch barrel guns. Now everybody always wants to know what did a gun cost back then? And I already told you that for the military, they cost $13 and then dropped to $12.50. So what was the price on the civilian market? Well, the initial list price for a Colt single action army revolver was $17, a, a princely sum. And by the late 1870s, that price had gone up to $20, which for most working stiffs was about two thirds of a month's pay. So a pretty significant investment. Now, usually we don't see prices come down, but by 1888, and I guess thanks to the competition out there in the market, by then, Colt dropped their price from $20 to $16. In the 1870s, the principal wholesalers for the Colt Single Action Army were Schuler, Hartley, and Graham, H.D. Folsom, J.P. Moore's Sons, Spies and Kissam of New York, and Benjamin Ketteridge of Cincinnati. Uh, Benjamin was the guy who had a real knack for advertising. He's the guy who gave the 1877 double action the moniker of uh, Thunder and Lightning, Thunderer and Lightning, right? He called the 1878 double action the Omnipotent, and he's the one who coined the term Peacemaker for the Colt Single Action Army. So, pretty famous guy. But those, those firms I just mentioned, they formed a cartel. And they locked up the exclusive rights to wholesale the Colt Single Action Army. And they also negotiated a fixed price for it. So they bought 12,000 Single Action Armies over the course of five years 
at a price of $10.50 each. So that's a $2.50 discount over the price the government was getting even. Now, in exchange for that, they actually paid for all of Colt's advertising for the Single Action Army for that entire period. But at the end of five years, that cartel broke up, and Colt started wholesaling to anybody who showed up with a valid check. So uh, the era of the cartel was over. So the standard civilian Model P was basically the same gun that was sold to the Army. Uh, but, you know, over the 70-year production run of the first generation of Colt Single Action Armies, it did see a number of minor changes. And we're going to talk about some of those right now. And I think we'll start with barrel length. So in 1873, uh, you know, Colts were kind of like Ford Model T's. You could get them in any color you wanted as long as it was black. Well, you could get Colt single actions in any barrel length you wanted as long as it was seven and a half inch. But that didn't remain that way forever. And I'm going to caveat it by saying that was really only in the domestic market. Because very early in 1873, Colt produced some single action armies for its British market. Now, those were in 450 boxer cartridge, and they all had five and a half inch barrels, and they were sent off to London. Uh, and there were some other deliveries as well during those early days when Colt was devoting all of its domestic production basically to the military market here in America. So the five and a half inch barrel length actually came into being almost concurrently with the seven and a half inch barrel length. It's just that we didn't see them here in the domestic market for a few years. Uh, but once domestic production started, the five and a half inch barrel was available along with the seven and a half inch barrel. And over time, the five and a half inch barrel became the most popular barrel length on Colt single action army revolvers. So we went that way in the first few years of Colt production, where there were basically two barrel lengths available, 7.5 and 5.5. And, and, and then in 1879, Colt introduced the 4 and 3 quarter inch barrel length, with the barrel the same length as the ejector rod housing. And I like to call this the gunfighter's barrel length, because uh, guys like Bat Masterson, they really appreciated that. When Bat ordered his guns, and he ordered them, directly from Colt himself, and he had quite a few single actions. Uh, though not as many as are attributed to him, I have to say. He was uh, he was a bit of a cagey investor. Bat, Bat would go out if he needed a few bucks, and as most people know, Bat Masterson later in life became a sports writer in New York City. Now, go figure. Right? So, and he was a sports writer for newspapers in New York City for quite a few years before he died. But when Bat needed a little extra drinking money, he would go to a New York City pawn shop and he would buy some doggy Model P for a buck or two, file a few notches in the stocks, and then sell it as the gun that he carried in Dodge City or, you know, in, uh, in Leadville or Trinidad. So he would get a premium for it and uh, because, you know, it was, it was his gun, right? Uh, Bat Masterson's gun. But, might have been Bat Masterson's gun, but he certainly didn't have it in Tide City. But, the fact is, he did like four and three quarter inch barrel lengths, and he would order them directly from the Colt company. And he stipulated, he said, I want your model, single action model, please make the barrel the same length as the ejector housing, and make the trigger on the light side. So, he knew what he wanted. So in 1879, that came out. And like I say, a lot of people today think that that was the most popular barrel length, you know, especially guys who are in single action uh, shooting society, uh, you know, cowboy action shooting competitions. They like that short barrel, get it out there fast. But 
you know, whenever I've asked over the years what the best seller is, uh, it's always been the five and a half inch, the artillery length model, not the gunfighter's length model. Four and three quarter, five and a half, and seven and a half. Those were the standard official factory barrel lengths. That's what they produced them in in their production runs. You could get any length you wanted on a special order. All it took was money. I mean, I'm pretty sure if you said you wanted an 18-foot barrel, Colt would have built you an 18-foot barrel. They just would have charged an arm and a leg for it. But those were the three official barrel lengths. So what other changes have we seen over time in the single action army? Well, you know, a lot of them are kind of subtle. That little button on the end of the ejector rod, that's changed over time. When that was first developed in 1872, it was round like a donut with a hole in the middle of it. Right? And that's known as the bullseye ejector rod. And there are a lot of people who think that that was used through the entire like black powder run of the single action army, but that is not true. In fact, it wasn't really used for all that long. In 1881, the ejector rod button was changed to the crescent type that we're all familiar with today. So, for most of the classic cowboy period, it would have had the crescent ejector rod. Now, I'll be honest with you, I really prefer the look and feel of the bullseye ejector rod. Uh, I, I have both kinds on my Colts. But I, I fitted a lot of my clone guns with the bullseye ejector rod heads because I just liked them. So that's my personal preference. Originally, the grips on all of the single action army revolvers, the grips on uh, the civilian Colts originally were the same one piece varnished walnut grips that you would have found on the military models. And that was the case until 1881. Uh, just like when the bullseye ejector had changed, well, that same year, Colt went to the two-piece hard rubber grips uh, that have become associated with the Colt Single Action Army. Originally, in 1873, the base pin that the cylinder revolves on, that was secured to the frame by a set screw that screwed into the very front of the frame and screwed into a notch on the base pin and held it in place. So in order to get the cylinder out, back in the old days, you needed a screwdriver. You had to loosen that screw so you could slip the base pin and then pop the cylinder out. And that was the case until 1896. In 1896, Colt uh, implemented on the single action army the transverse spring-loaded um, cylinder pin screw. Now why they waited till 1896 I have no idea because they were actually using that same arrangement in 1877 on the double action uh, you know Thunderer and Lightning models and ditto on the 1878. So why they waited so long to implement it on the Model P, I'm not sure. Now the next, I'd say really important change, I mean a really important change, and the one that also has some uh, disagreement associated with it, is when the Colt Model P was certified for smokeless ammunition. And those dates vary depending on what source you look at. Some sources say 1896, some say 1898, some say 1900. And it's because Colt wasn't very forthcoming about saying when they certified him. <laughs> so that becomes a problem. So Colt first advertised the Model P as being certified for smokeless in 1898. So, therefore, I'm kind of inclined to accept the 1898 date. Uh, the real documentation, though, is in Colt's shipping records, because in Colt's shipping records, they specifically state 
that the Model P was not certified, not certified for smokeless, uh, for serial numbers 75, 175,000 through 180,000. All right, so they are saying that serial number range, not certified for it. So not 1896, not until serial number 180,000. And serial number 180,000 was produced in 1898. So it kind of lends credence to that. My personal rule of thumb is I don't shoot smokeless in a Colt Model P made before 1900. Uh, I, I feel that like that's just the margin of error. And I don't mind shooting black powder, so it's not a big deal to me if I get one to shoot, I'm happy to shoot it with black powder uh, because I don't want to take a risk on damaging it. I, I feel there's no guarantee that they are truly certified for smokeless powder until then. So let's talk chamberings. The Colt Single Action Army was ultimately chambered in over 30 cartridges. Obviously some more and some less. So there were five major cartridges that was chambered for in, in terms of the volume. And by far the overwhelming number one is 45 Colt. In the first generation there were 158,884 guns chambered for 45 Colt. Of course, it was introduced in 1873, and they are still chambering guns in 45 Colt uh, to this day. So, number one most popular. Number two, and I'm sure you would have guessed this, is the 4440, or 44 Winchester Centerfire. That was introduced in 1878. And they produced 71,392 of those. So, you know, as you can see, it was about half, a little less than half, actually, of the number produced in uh, 45 Colt. And, and as you'll see with the others, they kind of stepped down geometrically. So next were the, uh, the 3840 that had... 50,520 produced, and the 3220 that had 43,284. And both of those cartridges were introduced in the same year, 1884. And that takes us through the popular Winchester rifle cartridges of the era. Uh, so Colt made companion guns for the Winchester rifles. And those were the most popular, except for 45 Colt. And then when we drop out of those, and it's, it's fifth lagging quite a bit, was the 41 Colt. And the 41 Colt was introduced in 1885, and 19,676 of those were made. And the 41 Colt is kind of an interesting caliber. The 41 Colt is essentially the 38 Special of the 19th century. It had very similar uh, ballistics and power to a modern 38 Special. And it was quite a popular gun uh, in the Colt lineup. So that had the number five spot for most popular chamberings for the Colt Single Action Army. But the gun was ultimately produced in everything from 22 Rimfire up to 476 Ely. <laughs> so anything that would fit in the, uh, the cylinder length, at some point a Colt was probably chambered for it. So those are the detail changes that all of the Colts went through over time. But there are also some major variations of the single action army. And we're going to talk about those now, and, and those are the Sheriff's model, the flat top target model, and the Bisley model. Now what I'm not going to include is the bunt line. And the reason I'm not including that is because that is not something that the factory 
ever considered to be an official variation. So guns that we colloquially call the sheriff's model or the shopkeeper's model, those are guns, standard Model P's in every other way, but they don't have an ejector rod housing. And by that, I don't mean that somebody unscrewed the ejector rod housing and pulled it out of the gun. No. What I mean is that they have no place to put an ejector rod. Right? So that, that part that docks the ejector rod on the frame, gone. Right? The frame looks the same on the right side and the left side. There's no facility, no place to put an ejector rod housing at all. And those guns were mostly made for concealment purposes. Uh, and it's kind of funny because we think of a sheriff's model or shopkeeper's model as being a short barrel gun. And for the most part, they were short-ish. Um, but believe it or not, 3% of all the factory produced sheriff models had seven and a half inch barrels. Well, Almost hard to believe. In fact, only 2% of the sheriff's models had 2.5 inch barrels, and only 4% of them had 4 inch barrels. So more surprising to me is that only 2% of sheriff's models had 2.5 inch barrels, and only 4% had 3 inch barrels. And by far, 3.5 inch and 4 inch barrel guns were the most popular. 33% of all the sheriff's models made were made with three and a half inch barrels. And believe it or not, 54% of all the sheriff's models made had four inch barrels, by, by far the most popular. So the next variation I want to talk about is the flat top target model. They were first produced in 1888, and just over 900 of these guns were made during the entire production run. In fact, all of them were made between 1888 and 1896. So as the name suggests, the flat top target model had a frame that instead of having the concave top, had a flat top. And it had a blade rear sight that was dovetailed into the back of the frame. And the front sight was a blade, you know, post, right? Uh, that was bolted basically to a block that was soldered to the end of the barrel. So it was a high visibility target type front sight and a target type rear sight. A lot of these guns were produced in 44 Russian caliber, which was considered to be one of the most intrinsically accurate uh, cartridges of the 19th century. So the last variation I'm going to talk about is the Colt Bisley model. And this was introduced in 19, in, excuse me, in 1894 as a target pistol. And it's named after the very famous Bisley target range in England. Uh, the, the Bisley model is quite different from the normal Model P. So the shopkeeper's model differed in that it had no docking port for the ejector assembly. The flat top model, because of its flat frame and sights. The Bisley model is most noticeable because of its grips. It has a completely different grip configuration, much straighter than the Colt Single Action Army. It also has a very low slung hammer and a very curved trigger. Uh, now the frame at first glance looks like a standard Model P frame, but it's not. In order to accommodate the vastly different grip assembly and hammer, you actually need an entirely different frame. So the Bisley frame is unique. Uh, it also had a unique uh, mainspring that attached to the hammer via a, a stirrup, uh, which is a much more modern way of, of doing it, really. And all that was to produce a faster lock time 
less time for the hammer to fall and set the cartridge off, uh, which, which for a handgun gives you more accurate results if you can shoot it that well. And this gun got quite a few accolades as a target gun, and they did make some flat top target model Bisleys, uh, but they're, they're kind of a minority. As it turns out, Bisleys were fairly popular with the non-target shooting civilian crowd. And a number of people used them as concealed carry guns, which I know may be hard to believe, but they felt that the low slung hammer on the Bisley concealed better than you know, the big spur hammer on the Model P. Uh, now, personally, a lot of people love Bisleys. Personally, I'm not a big fan because the grip is uncomfortable to me. I, I don't shoot them well. I, I much prefer the regular plow handle grip on, uh, on the Model P. But a lot of people absolutely love them, and they are a very popular uh, subject of collecting on their own. Well, the last subject I want to discuss in Colt's evolution of the single action army are the generations. And there are three generations of the Colt single action army. The first generation, which is what we have been largely discussing, was from 1872, 1873 really for the first deliveries, until the start of World War II. And at that point, the machinery was getting kind of worn and Colt had to move it out of the factory to make room for wartime production machinery and they just discontinued the, uh, the Model P. Most of the changes we've been talking about occurred in that first generation. And I'm going to call them organic changes. They changed because of a, a performance increase that those changes would deliver. Okay. So next we've got the second generation. And that really owes its life to the extreme popularity of Western TV shows in the 1950s. And the fact that other companies like Great Western and Ruger got into the single action game because Colt was out of it. And, you know, Colt said, hey, I think I want a piece of that action too. So they brought the machinery back in and started producing single action armies again. So uh, the second generation was made from 1956 until 1974. And the second generation carried the serial numbers in a range from 0001 SA to 73,205 SA. So that's the second generation. A lot of people believe, and, and I am one of them, that the second generation Colts are the best shooting Colts of all three generations. Now I, I have one second generation Colt, and it was made uh, in the, the mid-1950s. And it's a superb gun. I mean, quality of workmanship was as high as Colt ever had it. Uh, they're beautiful, they're accurate, everything is fine. So those are the second generation. And I'm not going to talk about variations within the second generation because a lot of these things in the second and third generation, the variations are commemoratives uh, or things like that. Now there are a few make production cheaper variations that come up in the third generation, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to really dwell on those. So the third generation was from 1976 until the present. So it was out of production for two years. And that's because the machinery had gotten so worn Colt couldn't use it again. So they had to retool up, make new machines. So the serial number ranges on the third generation are SA 80,000 to SA 99,999. Now after that serial number range, they went to a new serial number range that started with S, and then the number, and then an A. Okay, and they're, they're still using those. Now, the thing about the third generation is, and, and I have a third generation gun. The guns I looked at, like in the early 90s, particularly, 
late 80s, early 90s, they were poorly made. I mean, they looked nice on the outside, but you'd cock them and you'd think somebody had, uh, had sprinkled sand in the action. So they were terrible. And back then, when I complained to Colt about it, they were very cavalier. And they said, look, nobody's going to shoot these guns anyway, Mike. People buy these guns as investments. If they wanted to shoot, they'd be shooting in a birdie, <laughs> you know, something like that. That's affordable. Because the guns even then were hugely priced, right? So, you know, Colt said, these people aren't even going to cock them because they don't want to put a ring on the cylinder. They're just buying them as investments. And I pointed out to him that not everybody was buying them as investments. Uh, people wanted to shoot them. I shoot mine. Um, it took a while for that to sink in, I have to say. But by the end of the 90s, I think Colt had got it. And, and this gun right here is a third generation gun from the very early 2000s. And it's an excellent gun. But even so, I still sent it to Tom Sargis for a complete tune-up. Uh, because, I'll be honest with you, even as good as they come from the factory, if you want to get the most out of them, you should send them to a single action expert like Tom. And he can turn it from a very good gun to an outstanding gun. Uh, which is what I did with this one. But Colt had gotten better, and you know, I haven't tested any of the current production, but I, I'm pretty sure it's going to be good. They're all made by the custom shop now, and uh, they go over them pretty carefully. So those are the three generations of Colts. As I say, the gun has been with us for almost 150 years, uh, and it's still going strong. So... I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it was educational for you and not too boring. And if you liked it, please give it the big thumbs up. Uh, hopefully I still have a channel for you to do that on. <laughs> yeah. But give it a thumbs up. Helps us with the algorithm. And uh, subscribe to the channel. Helps us a lot. We're almost at 100,000 subscribers. I really want to clear that hurdle just for personal reasons. So if you're not subscribed... Uh, do it for me. It doesn't cost anything. And I'll come up with something else to talk to you about next week. Until then, bye.